Uh, so it's an absolute pleasure to be able to invite to the stage uh, Professor Val Curtis from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, who thinks about this stuff all the time. <coughs> I should just tell you that Val has lost her voice. Um, and this is a, a, a lovely cup of hot honey and lemon provided by the facilitators of the conference. Thanks, guys. So please bear with Val while she uh, gives us her talk. Good luck. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> so please forgive me. I'm the one thing you need when you're doing an international plenary is a voice. <laughs> I hadn't realised quite how important it was. Um, I wanted to thank, every, thank the organisers for the invitation, first of all. Um, but I wanted to talk about behaviour. So let's, let's do some behaviour. So I'd like a volunteer, please. I'd like someone in the audience to stand on their chair and sing a song for me. <laughs> Why are you laughing? There's so many of you. Somebody must be willing to stand on their chair and sing a song for me. Yeah? Yeah? Here? Why are you giggling? <laughs> At the back? Surely there must be somebody. Why, why are you looking so embarrassed? <laughs> okay, it's all right, you can sit down. <laughs> why is that so difficult? Why did you all look at each other and go, did she mean me? Why did some of you go red? Why did some of you think, oh my God, she can't be serious. Did you feel the force holding you in your seat? Did you feel the treacle? Now that's why behaviour change is difficult. You are, how many conferences have you been to in your life? That was last year's. Maybe, what, 10, 15? Maybe this is your first conference. Maybe, but how many meetings like this have you been to? Hundreds? Conference rooms, lecture halls? So we all know the rules. And the rules involve sitting quietly and listening to the speaker, right? They don't involve standing on your chair singing a song. How many of you are facing backwards? You're doing what the chair tells you what to do. The chair is in control of your behaviour. <laughs> How many of you are listening to what I'm saying through the speaker? It's telling you what to do. Your life is not your own. Most of your life is led in settings which are like this. From when you get up in the morning to when you go to bed at night. When you're in the pub, you behave pub. When you're in the train, you behave train. When you're in the hotel, you behave hotel. I could predict your behaviour to a very high degree of accuracy wi without knowing a thing about you. Because we all behave we're as, if we be we're as if we're on rails, right? Everything we do is set down and programmed. I'm sorry to bring you the bad news. I'm sure you think you're really in control of your own behaviour. <laughs> and if anybody did stand up and sing a song in this room, somebody would come along and say, sit down, because we're trying to achieve something here. We're trying to have a conversation. And you'd be th if you refused to sit down, security would throw you out. <laughs> if your chair was broken, somebody would come and fix it. So there's a certain homeostasis to settings as well that m ensure that we continue. Over the multiple hundreds and thousands of years that humans have been having meetings, the rules for meetings, the rules for conferences, the technology's evolved a bit, but the way we do things is very fixed. So if we're going to change behaviour, we need strong levers. We want to get the train off that straight up track and onto the other track. We need something to really shove it. So how are we going to do that? And how are we going to do that in a, con in a in a place like, like this? How many of you have offices? All right. Every one of you, pretty much. Anyone not have an office? It's getting up more and more unusual. Offices are places where we all do, where we're all on, on tracks. We all have files, whether our files are on the wall or in a machine. We all have desks. We all have rules, and there are symbols. You see the flags on the walls, for example. They keep us on track. Now, if we're going to change how people behave, we're going to have to disrupt those settings. We're going to have to make things different. But if you're working in India, how many offices have you got to change behavior on? You go, how many are there <laughs> in the Swatch Bharat mission? There may be one office of the Ministry of Water Development 
of, of water and sanitation. But every state has offices that work on sanitation. Every district, hopefully, works on sanitation. Every village has its sarpanch with his little, or her little office. And households, people are, their behavior is ingrained. They go to the toilet in the way they've always gone to the toilet for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So we've got a massive disruption job to do. So how are we going to do that? So this, I, I will have been, as Param was saying yesterday, the head of the mission in, in India was saying that we have to do things differently. I was originally invited to come and be behaviour change expert for this guy, but actually I've learned a huge amount from working with him and actually I don't know quite how much I've contributed, uh, or a very small amount. So I wanted today just to share with you the benefit of some of the learnings and some of the learnings from India that we're taking back to other countries. And I'm going to do it a bit through the, beha through the lens of behavioral science uh, and theory of change, which is the way that we think about how to change behavior. So let me just go back. I'm sorry, I slightly changed the order of the slides. Um, if you want to change, so you're all familiar with theories of change. You know that <coughs> if you want to change something out there in the world, up here. <coughs> I have a pointer, all right, I, I always change. There we go. Can you see the pointer? So if I want to change the state of the world, let's say I want everybody to have a toilet and use it. That means people have got to behave differently. They've got to get a toilet and they've got to use a toilet. Now what's going to make them behave differently? Our behavior is attached to our brains, right? In fact, it's what brains evolved to do. The whole purpose of brains is to make us do the things that were good for our ancestors in the past. So all of your psychology is actually about making you behave in certain ways. But that psychology doesn't happen in a, in a, in a vacuum. It, the environment determines how you behave. You choose behaviors depending on where you are and what you're doing. And that's the behavior setting that controls the rules, etc. It's not just the physical setting, it's the rules that control your behavior. Now our job is to come up with an intervention that can change the state of the world. But look how long that chain is. It's really difficult. You have to change the environment in a way that changes brains, that changes behavior, that changes the state of the world. Now, if you're looking at simple, a uh, simple, I call it simple, the, 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 where I normally work, which is the behavior of individuals, trying to change those, this is an example of a theory of change from the Superama program, which uh, in rural India got hand got people washing hands up from 3% to 30% over a year uh, and still maintained it over a year. Uh, the theory of change was that we wanted mothers and children to wash hands with soap. We didn't measure the benefits on health, but we measured the impact on the hand, on the hand washing uh, through mothers wanting to love their children and because they wanted their children to have high status. And so hand washing was good, good manners. We wanted them to feel that dirty hands were disgusting. And um, through events where this guy, Ladu Lingam, was offering sweets with filthy, dirty hands, he would be <laughs> rubbed on his bottom and there was a bit of mud, bit of and, and lovely superama who was making nice, fresh sweets for the children. So we, and we also changed the behavior settings. We changed the rules in the village. So once people had pledged, they would wash their hands with soap. It went up on the wall, and everybody could see everybody's signature on there. Uh, an another way of changing behavior, talking about settings, my colleague Robert Dreibel, based in Bangladesh, some of your colleagues here from Bangladesh know this work, um, changing the settings just quite simply in a school, plus painting um, footsteps and handprints on the hand washing facility, uh, increased the hand washing rates in the school by more than a standard hygiene education program without all the effort and, and expense. So you're impl implying by that intervention, by that, those cues that the rules have changed, that everyone is gonna, needs to wash their hands with soap. So how do we apply that understanding about behavior to the problem of offices and this office in particular? Um, they've done an amazing job. If we went back to the begin to when I first got involved in 2014, when the, when Prime Minister Modi took over and appointed um, Mr. Iyer as secretary, uh, we were at 39 percent. Now, if you extrapolate that to 100 percent at the same rate, we were talking about somewhere between 2060 and 2065 before 
we got to an open defecation-free India. Now, how many of you were motivated by the idea of, of working for a program that will get there in 100 years? It's, it's not terribly exciting, is it? But this is actually what's happening. This slide is actually out of date now, and 78% a year later. Swatch Parat started in 2014. There's a massive curve pending going on here. There's a massive amount of disruption. So how, how has it happened? Well, this is the theory of change that is my attempt to try and understand what's happening there. Uh, we're trying to make the country ODA. We need that chain of all of those office, officers sitting in their offices to do things differently. How are we going to make them do that? Their brains have got to change. There's something in their minds that's got to change. How is that going to work? Well, in India, you don't get promoted based on how good you are. You get promoted based on your seniority. So how on earth are you going to tell somebody it's going to help their, help their career? It's not going to work. But public recognition does work. Every, every one of us care about what people think of us. Status. Rewarding people for... I'm being embarrassed if you fail through monitoring, rewarding, and disruptive leadership that makes all of this happen. Now, how did that come about? What was the intervention that made that start to happen in India? Well, you can say that, as Barbara pointed out the other yesterday, that the time was right. The time was ready in India. New Prime Minister was aware on the international stage that as a modern country, it was being seen as the open defecation capital of the world. But modernization is what India is all about. So it was about the self-respect. The SDGs were, were important too. It was very clear that we were going to be talking about achieving open defecation free. But what, um, what Modi did, as Param said yesterday, was to set up a BHAG, a big hairy, audacious goal, one that people, it comes from in industry where people set stretch goals. It's possible, but it's difficult, it, it, but it's believable. It could actually be done. It's a very disruptive thing to do. A lot of industry have learned the, have learned the importance of that. So we're now, instead of 626 million open defecators in the world today, we're, we're, we, we've halved, India's halved that, which is amazing. So we're no longer the home of open defecation. Why? I'm buzzing. Thank you. Um, part, of the, part of the trick has been symbolism. Um, changing the way people think about sanitation, making it something that's a, that's a mission for everybody. Uh, of course, this guy set up the idea of a, of a clean India. Um, it was part of what he tried to do, but he failed to achieve it. The symbolism of 2nd of October 2019. Do people know what that date means? It's Gandhi's 150th birthday. So this is going to be his biggest birthday present. Uh, open defecation free India. So this guy, on, you can't see it here, but he has, there's a, there's a board there on the wall. You, you're, how many, what's the date? How many days is it? I think he had 520 days counting down to that date. And every day he crosses that date off and puts the next date. Uh, and puts the number of days down, and he's down to 200, some, something like 200 days until that. So it gives a sense of urgency to everybody about dealing with it. But you have leaders. What you, why on earth would a, would a leader want to be associated with toilets? It's dirty, disgusting, it's horrible. But you know, we all naturally distrust leaders. We all think that they're in it for themselves. So it's really clever politics, this. That if you're in it for toilets, how can you be in it for yourself? makes you look humble, makes you look like a serious person. But one of the things I've learned as a disgustologist is that if you're talking about disgusting things, it contaminates you. People who talk about toilets become disgusting. I've always found it very hard to recruit students to work in sanitation. Making the topic sexy is, is, is a really difficult one. And I think it's not no surprise that very, very fairly confident people like Barbara, for example, and Nick, and many of us in the room are actually quite are comfortable talking about toilets uh, and talking about shit. Uh, and Modi was too. And Param showed the way by climbing into a toilet himself. This was front page news uh, across India in many of the newspapers and emptying the toilet to show that a top, Indi top Indian bureaucrat leading by example, Param Iyer cleans the toilet to show the, 
So this is disruptive leadership. I talked about symbolism. We talked about Gandhi is everywhere. You know those glasses? We hardly notice them, but those are Gandhi's glasses designed by a, uh, designed in, in a competition. Uh, more symbolism, um, always using dates, uh, women's, International Women's Day. Uh, it's going to be, uh, an, um, so the Spot Shakti, there were 6,000 women Sarpanches uh, attended uh, a conference in, in Gandhi Nagar. Uh, women heroes celebrate World Water Day. The cleaning of iconic places in India, it's part of, part of the Spot Bharat mission, grabs the attention, gets the imagination, gets people interested. Uh, so disru that was disruptive leadership, live monitoring. You can go online now, if you go onto your, you can find the Swatch app on your phone and you can check what the status is of toilets in India. And you can see it ticking. It's the most extraordinarily motivating um, experience to actually look at this app and go, oh my goodness. You know, so this was, uh, that was the previous conference I was talking at. And, and in the time it took for that conference, that many, ta uh, uh, two million toilets were built. These are geotagged toilets that are being reported um, with photos of them and uploaded to the government's monitoring and information system. And that was yesterday. Uh, and you, can you see the number? 62 million toilets have been built. And it ticks as you watch it. It's really exciting. But, but more than that, uh, you can then hold every district to account. And that's what they do. This is just the in the conference room at the ministry. Um, there are 150 people linked in on this, uh, the 150 different districts linked in on this. You can talk to all of them, uh, and, and Param can ask them, how, how, what's your toilet rate? How are you doing? Why are you failing? Why are you succeeding? Very public way of, of being held to account for. And he's been to uh, 114 different um, trips uh, in, the, in the last two years, going to visit all of these places and holding them to account so that we know, so the newspapers tell us Who's number one and who's number two? Uh, and all this information is fed. Th this is a photo for, of a sarpanch that I visited in one village. And the first thing he shows me when you go to the village is, his, is, his, is the rewards he's been getting. He's been given certificates for making his village open defecation free. This old lady is being honored by the prime minister for making her, her village open defecation free. These are film stars. Uh, if you go into their app, you know, sorry, if you go into Facebook, it's constant. Uh, reward, 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 and it's very cheap behavior change because all you need is a certificate and a, and a handshake. But it does, it does wonders to get everybody motivated. Uh, these things, they're called the creatives. This is one of the, this, this isn't what ministries normally do, but districts get these little, all they are are little artworks that are sent to them on Facebook or on, uh, or, or on, uh, or on WhatsApp. And they get disseminated far and wide, and the districts really complain if they don't get their creative when they achieve open defecation-free status. And again, these are super cheap to produce, but not something a ministry would normally do. That's something that the support from the Tata Fellows, the Prerax, uh, has enabled them to do. That bit extra, the PR, the press, um, the, the constant support, constantly uh, working with the press to feed them fantastic stories about what's going on. Um, and, and how many of you have seen this? Please go see it. It's fantastic. It's a, it was the biggest grossing fil Bollywood film last year. Now, how the heck did it happen that 30 million people have been to see this film? I mean, <laughs> why? It's beyond, but beyond my wildest dreams as a behavior changer, the sort of budget I would get to actually get to that many people. Uh, but it didn't cost them anything. It was, uh, what's his name? Akshay Kumar got excited about it and raised the money himself. And, and got this film, got this film made, and it tells the whole story of how a, a woman uh, what, gets married to a guy who she loves deeply, but his family are deeply traditional and won't let them build a toilet, and that creates huge. It's a, it's a very dramatic story. She she goes off to she uses the train as it stops in the station, and of course you can imagine one day things go wrong and she gets, she ends up on the train to a far distant. Uh, locked in the toilet. Um, it, anyway, it, I, I won't spoiler alert. I'll tell you what happens in the end. Please go and see it. It's, it's really a super film. Uh, and another one of the tricks is uh, it can seem completely daunting. Such a huge country, so much to try and change. Uh, the, the approach is to just 
okay, we can't do everything, but let's create some islands of success. Let's go and make a big effort in one district and show that it really works, and then make sure that that district disseminates its, its results. So we're kind of on a campaign footing. We're trying to get eye-catching events that happen at every level, and it's, it is, as Param said, it's very much a bottom-up, a Jan Underlang. It's a, it's, a, it's a community movement where ideas, are ideas for interventions are supported, and I mean, it's mind-boggling, uh, the scale at which mobilization has happened. It's happened on a campaign footing, which is, very, which is completely different from a normal gov government way of working. And it's happened kind of with, with and besides and in spite of normal government mechanisms. It's diverted normal government efforts from other things. So for a few months, they're in campaign a, a district will be in campaign mode, getting the whole district open defecation free. Then, of course, they move on to something else. Um, so that was the theory of change for, for uh, Swatch Bharat. What about some of the lessons? So we've been trying to apply some of those lessons to the National Sanitation Campaign in Tanzania. Um, we're, we're a, we've set up an, uh, a consortium called the CLEAR Consortium, which uses our behavior-centered design approach supported by DFID. Uh, and we, again, have a huge job to do. Uh, across Tanzania, 10% uh, are defecating in the open. 55% uh, have a toilet, something like this, which is obviously not a hygienic toilet, doesn't meet the MDG, the SDG targets. And of course, hand washing, as always, forgotten. Still, sorry, Yugal, but it's pretty much forgotten in India as well. And we're not doing enough on hand washing. Um, but how many of you think, when you think of Tanzania, what, is that what you think of? I was just going through the photos, and it, 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 it's... It, Dar es Salaam is almost as developed as, as Brisbane is. I mean, it's, it's um, across the world, it's, things are changing, and yet we're kind of immured in this, in this idea that, that, that development isn't happening, that, that, that everyone is living in mud huts. And, uh, we have this sort of bias as, as NGOs to always see the poorest, and always, which, of course, is important that we do that but we're a bit blinkered sometimes. We don't realize that the world is changing so rapidly, so fast, so much development is happening. So if you fly across Tanzania, all you see is tin roofs now. You hardly see a, you hardly see, and you see building sites. Everybody has one member of the family who's in the city or who's traveled abroad and he's remitting money. And building is happening, building is happening, building is happening, building is happening. Modernization is happening, but the toilet's forgotten. It's still in the back of the house. It's still, it still looks like this. It's something we don't even think about and talk about. So how do we get that on to people's radar? So the theory of change that, that we developed was about, okay, we want Chobora, that's a good toilet. 100% Chobora, 100% clean hands in Tanzania. So what behavior do we want to change? People should improve their toilets and people should wash their hands with soap. So what needs to go into their minds? Well, after a lot of formative research trying to really understand what might drive, we threw out lots and lots of hypotheses about what might drive toilets, but we ended up with this idea that people, everyone's modernizing, but I, if I haven't got a toilet, perhaps I'm not completely modern. And if I haven't got clean hands, perhaps I'm not completely modern. And um, we also tried to imply that it's actually really easy, it's not as difficult as you think. So that's all part of the campaign. So the campaign that we're, work, we're developing at the moment is based on TV, radio, billboards, uh, with emo demos, emotional demonstrations. If you want to know what those are, come to, come to the next session where we talk about hand washing, uh, road shows, tie-in, and also supporting the market. And what we're trying to do, our intervention is a bit like in India. We're trying to galvanize the government. So we started off with a campaign called Nipotayari, which means I'm ready. And this was the galvanizing the government piece, the PR campaign. It's the big, the national sanitation campaign is coming and we're going to be reporting the monitoring data, constant meetings at every level with the, with, with the, with throughout the system. Uh, and one of the really, so, so for people to change their minds in in institutions, we found that their legacy was really important, a bit like in India where you're not going to get promoted, but you feel that you've done something and left something behind, um, and you'll get public recognition and you'll be embarrassed if not so similar. 
Uh, so the, we want the government to drive new money to, and we want the partners to invest. And though we haven't got um, John Magafuli yet on board, he's watching us very closely. And as soon as we show that we're being successful, our, our, our antenna tell us that he's going to jump on board and start driving this. Uh, so that's what we're, what we're aiming for. This is the Nippo Tayari campaign. Uh, some of you may know Jennifer Sarah. Uh, this is everybody, uh, everybody who's anybody at any meeting. We nabbed them, made them use this circle and clay and, and pledge that they were ready for the national sanitation campaign. Uh, this is the dashboard. It's not as sophisticated as the Indian one, but we're working on that. Uh, the stroke of genius in, in, in Tanzania was to find out who the political classes listen to. And it turns out it's the head of this organization, a guy called Ruge, who is who has every top politician on speed dial. It's a bit like a Rupert Murdoch, uh, who knows everybody and anybody, and, ev and everyone listens to him. And we're using them as our media partner so that though they reach out to the, ho to the whole country and, the, and our target audience, actually what they've been doing most is reaching out to the decision makers uh, who, li who, who, who absolutely listen to, to Clouds FM. So this is a major part of the program. So this is the launch that we had a few weeks ago. Uh, you can see trying to be imaginative and different. Uh, this is the key to the toilet that's flown in on a drone. Uh, this is the minister taking it and opening the toilet. These are some certificates, of course, being given out. And huge, huge audience, because we had the Tanzania All-Stars there who, 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 were, who, who were kind of on, on speed dial also from Clouds FM, and they can be brought out to the... So we had screaming girls. and. The first time I've seen screaming girls at uh, a toilet event. It was fantastic. <laughs> uh, so where are we in terms of lessons? Uh, remember that treacle. Remember how difficult it is. Don't just take for granted if you suggest to somebody they should do something, they'll do it. You've got build on the fact that, that the time is ready. Good sanitation, as Param said, good sanitation is good politics. Um, there was a poll recently on Modi's um, performance, and uh, the top issue that he's known for is toilets. It was the number one issue on his uh, on his on his charge sheet, and he's going to he's doing very well. He's going to get in uh, again next time, almost certainly. Uh, set a challenging BHAG. Let's not say 2030 for goodness' sake. Let's say so in Morogoro, one of the regions in Tanzania. We're going three months' time. We're going to make Morogoro non uh, open defecation free. Uh, the job of the government, a l slightly different from the normal job of government, but if we can get there, that they create the vision, that they convene and lead, that they coordinate. Now, planning is traditionally what governments do, but I thought one of the things I'd be doing, helping in Swatch Barat, was to help with the planning, and no, there isn't. I mean, there is, am I allowed to say this? There isn't a lot of planning. <laughs> it's a campaign. It's, it's inspiration. It's from today or tomorrow. We, the, minister, the, the, the team don't know where they're going to be because it depends where the opportunity arises to get in there and do something. So it's, it's, uh, the planning is part of it, but it's, um, but it's more about inspiration and, uh, and, and being flexible and ready to move right. At the, right at, uh, supporters, I mean, by that I mean all of the, the private sector, the NGOs, the different public foundations. Uh, Param has been a great uh, saying, I need this, I need that, give me this, give me that. Uh, but he doesn't, need, he doesn't have time for a lot of complicated negotiations over contracts, uh, working with different NGOs. Is, or, or, or it's, okay, the World Bank's made some movies, let's, let's, let's show them. It wasn't part of the plan, but it got, they got made, so we're going to use them. So it's opportunism. Uh, with, with, uh, without the transaction costs. He's got no time for transaction costs. Uh, imagination, creativity, surprise, it's about emotion. It's about reason too, but it's largely about emotion. So I guess my big message is we can do it. We can bend the curve. We can get through that treacle. We can do things differently. And I think we should get on and do it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Val, and well done. You got to the end. You were still, we could still hear you. It was, uh, actually, I could have heard a pin drop, so uh, yeah, I think it was fine. Thank you very much. Um, Don't kiss me. I'll I'm it. not going anywhere. <laughs> um, this is as close as I'm going. Um, I studied public health. Uh, <laughs> yes, I am going to wash my hands afterwards. Um, can I just ask you one, one question? Um, 
for people in the room who are going back not to a Tanzania, not to an India, where it's a bit hard to know, do you have a do you have an idea of what what would be you know what's a, what what are the good indicators that maybe the time is right? You know what what would be the couple of things that that make you think right now we need to go to uh, I can't think of a country that's a nightmare. I have hundreds of people in front of me from all sorts of countries. Bhutan, for example, how would we know? Um, I mean, the SDGs have certainly created that globally, and countries know in the same way that that, that there's the people are being measured on their progress internally to countries. They're being measured on progress b between countries as well, and countries can't afford to be seen to, to be lagging. So I think uh, I think the time is definitely right <laughs> in every country. Um, and I think if it's not quite ready to tip in the place you're working, then your job is to start making it tip. Look for those disruption points. Look for how you can band together. Look for how you can join your efforts together with others rather than doing individual efforts. Look for how the government might need just a little bit of help. Just like, for example, in India, where just having a couple of people who are creative and, and good at PR sitting in Paran's office allows them to get their message out in a way that mo m most governments can't. So, I think there's massive opportunities now in every country to start making this happen. And the success breeds success. Success stories, they show it's possible. So we can go, I think we should, like I said, we should get on with it. Great. OK, so let's do that. Um, <laughs> but before you get on with it, in the morning session, we are going to allow you to have a cup of tea. Uh, we have eaten slightly into your tea break, but I didn't want to stop either of the speakers because I think uh, just giving a sense that these big challenges are, are solvable. You know, it's easy to feel, I think both of you mentioned the kind of paralysis that can come from complexity. But, you know, these are stories about places that have been transformed um, by the efforts of a huge number of people, but triggered, as you say, by some critical interventions. So go and have a cup of tea. Uh, and at half past 10, I encourage you to move on to the sessions as usual. Uh, really look forward to the morning's uh, proceedings and look forward to seeing you back here in the afternoon for the final plenary. Thanks so much. <laughs>